So today, what are we going to discuss? You know, big question I get all the time is, Michael, how did the mafia, Cosa Nostra, become so uh, powerful in this country? The government was responsible for creating the mafia, Cosa Nostra, the strength of it today. Hey everybody, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. It is now Friday, October 23rd, and uh, boy, this year is finally starting to move along pretty quickly. As a matter of fact, next week, um, next Friday is October 31st, Halloween night. Uh, it's my 40th anniversary of becoming a made member in the Colombo family. And uh, fortunately, thanks to God having a different purpose in my life, I like to think that I've been remade, no longer a part of that family, but still, it's, uh, it's a date that will be uh, forever um, cemented in my being, I should say. But anyway, I hope everybody's doing well. Just a couple of quick updates. Uh, Monday, Mob Movie Monday. Again, I'm not going to reveal what the movie is. Tune in. You're going to enjoy it. Last week was great uh, with The Godfather. Great comments. I know you enjoyed that. One of the greatest movies ever made. Uh, Monday, we'll have another great one. You'll get my perspective on it. So tune in on Monday. And uh, this past weekend, had a sit down with Daryl Strawberry, and uh, I love Daryl. He's a dear friend, good brother in Christ. You're going to hear that interview, I believe, next week. I'm getting it ready for you now, so that's a good one coming up. Another thing, before I go further, I want to just send this out to everybody. You've been amazingly gracious and kind with your words and prayers for my daughter, Amanda, who underwent thyroid surgery on Monday. I'm pleased and blessed to report she's doing well, in a little bit pain, but the uh, Operation, the surgery was a big success, and uh, doctors very happy with the result, and uh, we're just all blessed and very happy here. So thank you so much. You know, it goes to show you when people care uh, how you can come together. I got thousands of well wishes, kind words, prayers, and they were genuine and sincere. I really appreciate that. You touch my heart, my wife's, my family's, and certainly Amanda. So thank you very much. I'll keep you up to date on that, but she's doing really well. So today, what are we going to discuss? You know, big question I get all the time is, Michael, how did the mafia, Cosa Nostra, become so uh, powerful in this country? You know, what, what really propelled them into the power that they had uh, for almost a century? And uh, I want to talk about that today because, ironically, um, it was the government, and I'm telling you this fact, it was the government that caused the mob to be organized, caused the mob to be somewhat corporate and gave them the power and the money they needed to survive and prosper in this life. Now, let's go back to prohibition. Before the prohibition came in, the mob guys from uh, Italy were just a, a group of guys trying to make a living, doing it the wrong way. Maybe they were doing a little gambling, maybe a little shylocking. They were shaking down businesses in their own towns in New York and New Orleans and places like that. Nothing big, no big money involved, and they weren't organized in any way, shape or form at all. Prohibition comes in, I think it was January 7th, 17th, 1920, and the world changed. Now, people, let me tell you something. Our government doesn't always get it right. I think we can see that today if we all want to be honest. And again, I'm not being partisan. I'm being bipartisan. Look on both sides of the, of the, uh, you know, the, the um, political parties. We don't always get it right. They make a lot of mistakes. They got our country in debt. Yes, the government has done that extensive borrowing, crazy programs, and yet they tax us like crazy. This is all wrong. We know that. We just don't know how to correct it. It's not all our faults. And I told you, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we don't hold our politicians accountable. They lie to us. We accept it. They make promises on the campaign trail. They don't follow through when they become president or they get into office. And this is our problem as voters. I understand it's hard to know what's going on. A lot of backdoor dealing, tough situation. But it's been like this for a long time. Let's talk about prohibition. Why did prohibition start? Well, the government just figured that, you know, there was a, a temperate, you know, movement going on at that time. And the government figured they could solve everybody's problems with alcohol or alcohol related problems and crimes by making it illegal. So, boom, prohibition comes in. 
What happens at that point? People that wanted alcohol, they're still going to find their alcohol if it's available to them. But it wasn't available to them, so a huge black market came into play. But before I get into that, let me tell you what happened. The mentality of people kind of changed because all of a sudden, legitimate law-abiding people that were drinking alcohol for uh, you know, entertainment, relaxation, whatever you want to call it, they became criminals. Weren't allowed to drink it, weren't allowed to consume it, weren't allowed to manufacture it, weren't allowed to transport it. So all of a sudden, legal people became illegal just by drinking alcohol. What else happened? Well, as a result of that, they said, hey, I was a legal guy one day, the next day I'm a criminal because I like to take a drink. People start to become a little bit more accepting of certain criminal activity, right? They did. What happened to businesses? You know, we're going through a pandemic now. Just think of this, overnight, the legal manufacturers, the legal retailers, the legal bars and lounges, uh, the legal transporters of, of liquor, they were all put out of business. Just like that, overnight, one act done. Talk about a pandemic. That was kind of a pandemic made by the government at that point in time. So what happened, what else happened? Did crime go away? Absolutely not. The murder rate shot up, I think, 80%. Burglaries, you know, uh, petty crimes all shot up 20, 30, 40 percent. Nothing was resolved as a result of prohibition. Nothing. Nothing good happened. It. Now what happens? There's a vacuum created for legitimate people that want alcohol. So the mob moves in. It wasn't real organized in the beginning. You know the deal with Al Capone and all these other people that got involved and they saw an opening. And people, I want to tell you this. There was no business ever in the United States at that time and for many, many years beyond. I know you're going to compare it to the drug business, and that's true. But back then, in the 1920s and so on and so forth, there was no bigger business than, illegal pro than the illegal sale, distribution, and manufacture of liquor. That was it. The mob took advantage of it, and they made hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. And in those days, that was real money. Yes, Capone, yes, Chicago, all over the country, they took advantage of it. And as a result, the mob gained strength. The government actually put the mob into big business, made them corporate, because what happened after that? After Prohibition ended, and I think uh, 1933 or so, the mob now had tons of money. They started to get organized, and they started to get into other businesses. Vegas, okay, was financed through money that was made through prohibition. Don't think it was anywhere else. It was really money made through prohibition. And uh, uh, Arnold Rothstein at that time, he gets involved in financing Broadway plays. He started to buy real estate. He started to make the mob more corporate. We went into this in another video. So the government actually gave the mob its initial strength got them to become organized because when you have so much money and you have a group of people, yeah, they started fighting among each other. You know the war, I'm not gonna get into all of that. We know the history of the mob with Luciano and Maya Lansky and, and, and uh, all the guys that were there at that time and how Luciano eventually created the commission, got everybody to work together. But they were able to do this because they had hundreds of millions of dollars now to work with. So in a way, the government was responsible for creating the mafia Cosa Nostra, the strength of it today. And uh, that's a fact, people. That's just the way it goes. And by the way, consumption uh, of alcohol during that time went down maybe 20%. But the price of beer, I think it went up between 800 and 1,000%. The price of, of regular liquor, hard liquor, it quadrupled, went up three, four, five, six times according to whatever it was that was being uh, distilled at the time. So, I mean, everything the government tried to do as a result of prohibition backfired on them in a big way. And of course it was repealed because look, you know, I know a lot of people compare alcohol to drugs and obviously there are some uh, effects of alcohol if you abuse it, you know, drunk driving we know is a horrible thing. And, and yeah, every once in a while, I don't think it's that common, people can die of alcohol poisoning, especially younger people. And there is long-term damage to your kidneys, your liver, whatever, we get it. But you know what? You can, you can suffer from the abuse of anything. If you eat too much and you get obese, it's bad for your heart. You know, anything. If you drink too much of anything, it's no good. So just about anything that is good for you in some ways can be bad for you if you abuse it. 
So um, I don't think alcohol should have ever, ever uh, been prohibited because it was something that people enjoy. And that's it. And you don't compare it to drugs because drugs is different. Drugs can be lethal immediately. Uh, it's a whole different category I don't want to get into right now. If you want to debate the drug business at one point in time, we can. But I will tell you this. Had it not been for prohibition, and you know I'm the one that tells you all the time that we weren't big drug dealers in that life in the mob, cause in Austria, we were not. Uh, other people dispute that, but we were not. It was hands off. Had there not been prohibition, maybe we would have gotten into drugs in the United States. I don't know. Okay, but it didn't happen that way. So take that to the bank. I know people are going to differ with me and say, oh, this one was a drug dealer. Yes. But as a policy, we weren't supposed to get involved in it. And as a result, there were other groups that were doing a lot more business in drugs than we were here in the United States. So um, that's what gave the, the, uh, the, the mob its power and really gave it its strength and its stronghold in this country. And by the way, there were a lot of politicians on the take back then. They didn't believe that prohibition should have been in effect. They wanted a drink. They wanted to capitalize on the money. So the, the mob started to get their political influence at that time also. So a lot of things uh, went in the mob's favor as a result of the government's mistake by uh, creating prohibition. And uh, they enforced it through the Volstead Act at that point, which wasn't very uh, efficient, believe me, uh, at that time. So this brings us to another subject. The mob, I think the golden years of the mob were certainly 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, right through to the 80s. But what happened then? Well, in a way, maybe the government got even. 1970, they uh, put the RICO Act on the books. In the mid 80s, we went into this. Giuliani started to use it very effectively. And as a result, um, you know, it took the mob down in a big way. So the government got even all these years later after they created the mob and the strength that it had throughout those years, kind of got even all those years later. And believe me, I don't believe it's going to be going away, but it's not as strong as it was during my time in that life and for you know several decades. It really wasn't. Um, and uh, something I want to get into that uh, I think is really important. For those of you that know me, you know that I'm a, you know that I'm a Christian. Uh, but, you know, aside from that, I love the book of Proverbs, the Old Testament book of Proverbs. I think Solomon, without a doubt, the most brilliant guy that ever walked the face of the earth, uh, with the exception of Jesus of Nazareth, who little advantage if we believe as Christians that he was God, and I do. Uh, but Solomon was brilliant. And I, I live by the book of Proverbs, or I try to, I should say, because I'm not perfect in any way. But I believe in just about every proverb that Solomon has written. He was so wise, so brilliant. And I think some of it applies to this. As I was reading, um, I started to think of this. And I think there are a couple of verses that really apply to what I'm talking about today. I want to read them. The first one is uh, Proverbs 16, 8. And what it says is this. Better a little righteousness than much gain with injustice. Well, I think we can certainly, as a former mobster, as somebody that's been indicted, you know, seven times, had two racketeering acts in, uh, with the feds, one with the state, 17 or 18 arrests, did 10 years in prison, huge fine and restitution. Uh, I can certainly say that it doesn't pay to get involved in criminal activity. Now, you've heard me say this. I'm like an echo chamber in saying this, but I have to say it all the time because I know a lot of young people are listening in. How do I know? I get comments from them all over the world, not only here in the United States. And, you know, I've been speaking to them over the past 25 years, and I want to make it very, very clear. Crime does not pay. If you get involved in criminal activity, sooner or later you're going to fall, and everything you gained is going to go by the wayside. Trust me on that. I lost millions that I had gained illegally. It's all going to go by the wayside. I'm fortunate to be alive and free. Some of these young people say, come on, Mike. I saw the movies. I saw Goodfellas. I saw Godfather. You guys had it on. Okay, going on, rather. You had all the cars. You had the women. You had the money. You had the power. And I say, yeah, that's true. But didn't you see the end of the movie? You didn't see what happened in Goodfellas? Who went to jail? Who got killed? Who lost everything? How come you didn't see that? They don't see that part. Well, it's my mission to make them understand that and see that part. It doesn't pay to get money illegally, people. And I don't glorify that life. There's things about it that I miss. There was some good points, but there's things about it uh, that I can tell you are just no good. It's an evil lifestyle. I'm not calling the guys evil, but it's an evil lifestyle because people get hurt. Families, 
people on the street, people involved, you can't get involved in. I want to read another verse that I think is very appropriate also. And I think about these things all the time. I think of Proverbs as I'm going through my daily uh, day. Uh, Proverbs 17, 9, very interesting. It says, he who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Think about that. And let's go back to the movie, uh, A Bronx Tale. Okay, when Sonny was asked, is it better to be feared or to be loved? And he says it's better to be feared. And I disagree with that. I said it's better to be loved. And again, I'm going to read this again. Proverbs backs me up because what he says is this. Again, he who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. What happened in our life? Everybody started telling on everybody. Informants started started, you know, turning their back on the life and on their friends and on their associates and on their compatriots. They started cooperating with the government. Why? Because it wasn't out of love uh, that they were uh, willing to cover over an offense. It was because they had fear. And then when, when things really got bad and they were facing life in prison or other things, what did they do? They decided to cooperate. Okay, whether they were justified or not, I'm not going to get into all of that, and I'm not coming down on the informants. I'm telling you the reality of that life. Because it's not a life based upon love, it's a life based upon fear in many ways, the, uh, the greed in many ways, uh, love of power, position. Because of that, and it just degenerates into that, even, even if it was going to start out in the right way, that's what it degenerated into. And as a result, people started to cooperate, and uh, it separated good friends. And Proverbs predicted it. And it will happen just about every time, people. And I want to say this. I want to compare it to what's going on in our government today. Look at these people. They're fighting with each other. There's such a hatred, such a vendetta among them. Okay, they're willing to spill their guts and just say, it's just terrible what's going on in our government. And we, the people, have to hold them accountable. Not going to get into that further. Remember, I'm writing a book, A Mafia Democracy. I'm going to open your eyes as to the, the operation of the government today. And people, this is not a gimmick. It's factual. It's going to be Machiavellian. It's going to be, you know, you're going to see it. You're going to see how the government's operating. Your eyes are going to be open. You're going to say, wow, it's true. So that's it for today. Uh, again, make sure you tune in on Monday, Mob Movie Monday. Uh, Tuesday, maybe. I think we'll be ready Tuesday. We're going to have the Daryl Strawberry interview. You're going to love that. You love the Bruce McDowell interview. Great comments. And there's more coming. I will be speaking to Mike Tyson as soon as the fight is over. November 12th, he goes. Donnie Brasco, he and I have been in touch. He's willing. Remember, I don't like Zooms. Okay, we're going to do sit-downs the way they're supposed to be, face-to-face. -face. We're going to have them done. So, uh, thank you for everything. Again, thank you for all the well wishes and prayers for my daughter. Most appreciated. Love you guys. Love all of you for just having such a sincere heart. What do I always say at the end? Be safe. Be healthy. God bless. See you next time.